If this is how you picture walking on Uranus, eh, you're wrong. Let's start this again. Are you ready to take a trip to the outer regions of the solar system? To explore the weirdest planet in our cosmic neighborhood? To venture down into a place that's never been studied up close by any spacecraft? Buckle up for an icy, violent, and stinky adventure because your mission is to spend five seconds on Uranus and come back if you can. Traveling to Uranus would be a long, strange journey. First, you'd have to spend 10 long years in a spaceship speeding toward the outskirts of the solar system. If you're lucky, you might even pass Jupiter and Saturn on the way. Just make sure you pack enough food and fuel. Well, there are some things you should know about this world. Uranus isn't a rocky planet like Earth. It's an ice giant like Neptune, and it's the only planet in the solar system that spins on its side. It spins fast, too. One day on Uranus is just 17 Earth hours. Of course, you wouldn't last that long on it. Not a chance. Once you arrived at your destination, you'd still have some work to do to get close to this giant blue planet. You might have to dodge Uranian rings. Yeah, Uranus has rings, 13 of them. They aren't big and majestic like the gorgeous rings of Saturn. The outer rings are bright and easy to spot, but the inner rings are narrow and dark. You'd have to navigate this part of the trip with the utmost care. As you made your way through the dusty rings of Uranus, you'd see its glorious blue atmosphere up close for the first time in human history. Take a moment to enjoy the... Ah, Uranus. <laughs> what an oddballs planet. You know, I flew by it a month ago. That was fun. You want to know why nobody, and I mean nobody, has ever tried to land anything on the surface of this bootyful planet? Because Uranus has no surface. It's just a swirling ball of toxic gas compressed around a small icy core. Oh, and wait till I tell you why those gases on Uranus are toxic. <laughs> yeah, uh, gross. Yeah, okay, thanks for your input, Chase. It's true, Uranus might have a calming blue color, but it's cold and toxic. Not the kind of blue planet you want to visit. That's okay, I think you should sit this one out. Here I go! Woohoo! Ah, it's brisk here. Oh, Rico, what's the temperature? Minus 224 degrees Celsius. Oh, that's cold. Well, that explains why I can't feel my fingers or my toes or the rest of my body. Okay, well, at least those five seconds are done. Okay, Rico, it's time to go home. Let's bounce. Impossible. If my calculations are correct, you will reach the icy core in 54.4 minutes. So? What? That wasn't the plan. And what's 0.4 of a minute? Use seconds, you dumb bot! I suggest you take this opportunity to study the planet up close and report back. Well, I suggest you take this opportunity and stuff it up your charging port! I don't have a charging port. No one cares, Rico! No one cares! Honestly, this sucks. Uranus smells like shit. Yeah, the reason Uranus smells so bad is that the clouds in its upper atmosphere are partially made up of hydrogen sulfide. Not only does this make the planet stink, but it's also pretty toxic. Whatever you do, do not inhale it. If you did, it'd make you faint and die instantly. What? Oh, it would've been real nice to know this before I jumped! Yeah, well, after falling through the stinky clouds at the top atmosphere, you'd find yourself in the mix of 82% hydrogen, 15% helium, and a bit of methane. Methane gas is what gives Uranus that bluish-green haze, because it absorbs light at the red end of the spectrum. Huh, these, uh, 
these clouds are getting a little weird. <laughs> kind of floaty. Yeah, the atmosphere on Uranus is very dense. After passing through its top layer, you'd stop falling and start swimming in it instead. As you were paddling deeper, you'd start getting pelted by frozen gas crystals. But at least the temperature would be rising. I don't know about that. I don't feel warm at all. Rico, give me the stats. The temperature around you has indeed gone up to minus 208 degrees Celsius. My calculations show you can expect minus 153 degrees Celsius in the lower atmosphere. Cool. Great. Ooh, ow! Ow! What is that? That? Well, that's diamond rain. Yeah, on Uranus, it rains diamonds. That's because the Uranian atmosphere is rich in methane, a single carbon compound. Under extreme pressure, the methane molecules break apart and crystallize into diamonds. But the worst part is the wind. You'd be dealing with winds gusting at speeds of up to 900 kilometers per hour. That's three and a half times stronger than a Category 5 hurricane here on Earth. Rico, it's getting tight in here. Oh, I can hardly breathe. And when I do breathe, it smells like ass. Of course, the pressure is a hundred times greater than the atmospheric pressure at Earth's sea level. You are approaching the mantle. The good news is you wouldn't splatter on anything because there's not much in the way of solids on Uranus. The Uranian mantle is made of water, ammonia, and methane ice. It would be pitch black in here, and thanks to the extreme gravity, you wouldn't be able to move a muscle. And it would still be incredibly cold. What you should be worried about is the immense pressure that would be rapidly increasing the closer you got to the planet's center. It would squish you before you ever got to the core. Oh, being crushed by Uranus! I always thought it would be way nicer. God. Well, in this extreme pressure environment, your carbon-based body could turn into diamonds and drop down into the core. What a spectacular way to finish this one-way trip to the center of Uranus. Chase? Oh, oh, right. Six hundred and thirty-five light years from where you are sitting, way out there in outer space, lies a planet. The first planet to be discovered within the habitable zone of a sun-like star. Its name is Kepler-22b. When a planet is located within a star's habitable zone, it means there's a chance that liquid water exists on its surface. And where there's water, there's also the possibility of life. Human life. How long would it take to get to Kepler-22b? What would the weather be like over there? And why would you need to get jacked before arriving on this new planet? This is What If. And here's what would happen if you lived on Kepler-22b. Kepler-22b is what scientists call an exoplanet. It's a planet outside our solar system. Spotting an exoplanet like Kepler-22b is often not easy. The bright glare of the stars they orbit tends to keep them hidden from our telescopes. What did scientists come up with to get around it? looking at the stars themselves to see if they can find anything unusual about them. They spotted Kepler-22b using what's called the transit method. They watched Kepler-22, the star this exoplanet orbits around, and noticed that its brightness changes over time. That was because Kepler-22b was blocking the star's light. With this, Scientists were able to learn both the size of 22b and how it orbits. And it looks like this distant space rock could become our next home. Okay, but what do we really know about Kepler-22b? Its mass is 36 times that of Earth, with a radius of 2.5 times larger than ours. 
One year on Kepler 22b is 290 days. It's also located 15% closer to its star than we are to the Sun. If Earth scooched over that close to our star, you'd be fried. Kepler 22b, on the other hand, is lucky to have a Sun that is remarkably similar to ours, but also smaller and cooler. This close proximity to its star allows the planet to receive about the same amount of sunlight as we get over here. The temperature on Kepler 22b could be about 15 to 22 degrees Celsius, similar to Earth's spring weather and quite habitable if you ask me. But our galaxy can be a cruel place and not everything is good news. Some models suggest Kepler 22b is rotating on its side, kind of like our very own Uranus. This may sound insignificant, but it adds potentially deadly complications. This would mean that its north and south poles are shrouded in either darkness or sunlight for half a year. And this ain't simply a matter of whether you're a daytime or a nighttime person. A world like Kepler 22b spinning on its side means that temperatures could change from boiling to freezing, which wouldn't be great for human life. I know, what a bummer, but don't despair yet because our galaxy is also big enough to include some hope. New studies suggest that Kepler 22b might be covered in an ocean 50 meters deep and that ocean would be able to act as natural climate control, keeping the wild temperatures at bay. You see, an ocean can store heat in the summer and release it during the winter, which results in a mild climate. Like you needed another reason to live close to the water. But hold on, how would you even make it all the way to Kepler 22b? I mean, even if you were traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 635 years. Your best bet could be to hibernate through the trip inside a device that preserves your body way past its natural lifespan, like cryogenic sleep. NASA has already developed a cryosleep chamber that can lower an astronaut's body temperature to as low as 32 degrees Celsius. This would trigger natural hibernation, during which catheters would provide your body with nutrients and remove any waste. But even in cryosleep, it would be quite the long, risky trip. This leads us to the most dangerous part about this journey. All that remains unknown about Kepler 22b. For starters, we still don't really know what gravity is like there. It could be twice as strong as our planets. If that was the case, a 10 kilogram sack of potatoes would now weigh 20 kilograms. And your body would also factor into the mix. Is your current weight 75 kilograms? Well, good luck suddenly dealing with 150 kilograms of you. And just for safety, settlers such as yourself would need to bulk up, really bulk up. Only through intense strength training would you increase your chances of being able to walk on Kepler 22b. And once you got jacked on Earth, you'd have to figure out ways to preserve that muscle through all 635 years of light speed travel. But humans aren't the only life form that would be affected by a stronger gravity. Plants brought from Earth for oxygen and nutrition might not survive on Kepler 22b when you try growing them there. And if you brought any animals with you, they'd need to step up the evolution process. Higher gravity could lead to creatures developing additional legs to move around. It could also determine the location and size of internal organs. But the mysteries don't end there. Scientists still don't know for sure that Kepler 22b is even a rocky planet. It might be gaseous, similar to Neptune, or it could be entirely covered with water. If you and the other first settlers woke up from your cryosleep and found yourself on a gas planet, 
Yeah, that would be a downer. You wouldn't have a solid surface to even land your ship. Not to mention a place to set up camp. In that case, you and your crew would need to figure out how to build a cloud city orbiting the planet. If you landed on an ocean planet, a submarine town would be in order. Discovering Kepler-22b is a rocky planet would be hitting the jackpot then, right? Well, not so fast. Venus is also made of rock, and yet its dense atmosphere, consisting of greenhouse gases, makes it uninhabitable, with scorching temperatures far too hot for liquid water. If this was also the situation with Kepler-22b, our only chance at thriving on this exoplanet would be to employ robots that could build underground shelters. The place where maybe, just maybe, the temperature might be cool enough for you to bear. It just goes to show you that a prime location is no guarantee for human survival. And as exciting as it might seem to find other worlds to inhabit, our own Earth remains the perfect habitat for humanity. Europa, the icy moon of Jupiter, a frigid world that would turn you into an astronaut popsicle and an atmosphere that would take your breath away. Literally, because Europa's atmosphere is so thin, it's almost non-existent. And while it's mostly made up of oxygen, this oxygen isn't breathable for you. You just wouldn't be able to inhale it in this extremely low pressure environment. And this frozen world has a dark secret. Deep under its thick crust of ice, it might just hide life. That's why we're sending a member of our team on a mission to explore Europa and find out if anything can survive in this unforgiving environment. Chase, we need you on this one-way trip to Jupiter's neighborhood. Mission Control, this is Chase, orbiting Europa and ready for landing. Did you know it would actually take you like six years to get here from Earth? But luckily, I'm already here and I love finding new alien buddies when they're not trying to kill me. All right, Chase, initiate the landing sequence. Already on it. Rico, start the landing sequence, I totally forgot. Landing sequence initiated. 500 meters and descending. 400 meters. 100. Touchdown confirmed. Oh, that's bright! It's bright! Oh, my eyeballs! That's strange. Europa is five times farther from the sun than Earth and gets much less sunlight than we do. It must be so bright because of Europa's icy surface. All that ice is highly reflective. That, plus an almost absent atmosphere, could make the light feel very harsh. So just use the protective tinted visor and your eyes will be fine. Chase, what's your status? Yeah, I'd say Europa's pretty similar to Earth. If Earth had no atmosphere, was covered in ice, and had absolutely no interesting oceans to see. So in short, it sucks, what if guy. I'm freezing out here. Yeah. You'd need an advanced thermal insulation layer in your suit to keep you warm. The surface temperature on Europa is about minus 145 degrees Celsius, and it can get as cold as minus 220 degrees Celsius. It's also bathed in radiation. That's because Europa orbits so close to Jupiter, and Jupiter has a massive magnetic field that traps a lot of high energy particles inside it. Your spacesuit would need to be able to withstand that, too. Great. Europa is one of the four largest moons of Jupiter. It's still slightly smaller than our moon, but it's a lot more exciting. Mainly because it has the potential to host life. Looks pretty lifeless, if you ask me. Well, it is, on the surface. Look, life needs three ingredients to exist on any world. 
the first one is liquid water. Well, Europa has plenty of that. NASA's Galileo spacecraft, which spent eight years orbiting Jupiter, gathered some data on Europa, too. And that data led scientists to believe that this moon has twice as much water as all of Earth's oceans. Well, I regret to report that your scientist data is wrong. I don't see no water, only ice. This mission is a waste of my precious time. No, no, no it isn't. You don't see them because these enormous oceans aren't on the surface. They're deep below Europa's thick icy crust. That brings us to another ingredient for life, energy. On Earth, life mostly gets energy from the sun, but that's not the case on Europa. First of all, because Europa is so far away from the sun, and secondly, because if there is life on Europa, it's likely we'd find it under the ice, where there's no sunlight at all. Europa gets its energy from the effects of tidal heating, and it has Jupiter to thank for that. Yeah, the enormous gravity of the solar system's biggest planet is constantly pulling on Europa, bulging and cracking its ice. This causes friction, and the friction heats this moon from the inside. That's why Europa's subsurface ocean doesn't freeze over like the rest of this frigid world. Europa might also have hydrothermal vents on its ocean floor, just like Earth does. These vents spew out heat, energy, and chemicals, potentially creating a habitable environment around them. The last ingredient for life is chemical elements. Most living things are made up of stuff like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And based on the data we collected about Europa, this moon's got all that. But of course, no one has ever been on Europa to confirm this. Until now. Uh, uh, and, and what's that? Yeah, those are Europa's famous cryovolcanoes. These volcanoes don't erupt with lava, but with water and ice. Ice volcanoes? That's sick! Oh my god. Okay, okay. So, how do you suggest I find life here? This ice looks thick. Yeah, you'd have to drill through it. And you'd need special equipment. Like a high-performance drill designed for extreme cold, electrically powered by a portable nuclear generator, lightweight with a heating mechanism and a sample retrieval system. Right, great. So just like the everyday stuff that you would just happen to carry around with you on your spaceship. No, I'm serious. I happen to have that on my spaceship. I have the best drill in the universe. I'm so excited to meet who's down here. Well, hold on. The chances of seeing any kind of life with your own eyes are slim. Because that life, if it exists, is likely microscopic. But if you get a sample of that salty water, well, you can examine it and maybe find traces of microorganisms. Eh, that's not how I pictured this mission, but well, since we're here, let's do this. While you can't improve the odds of seeing aliens on Europa, you can increase the opportunity of seeing more of Chase's epic adventures on What If. We've already traveled with them to Titan, Venus, even Uranus, and there's so much more we want to show you. That's why we launched our What If Explorers Club on Patreon. That's where we give you the top secret behind the scenes, extended director's cuts, mind-blowing art, epic merch discounts, and our endless love and gratitude. Support us on Patreon to get exclusive content and help us send Chase to his death over and over and over again. Hey! I, I don't feel so good. I, I think it might puke. Your body temperature is rising. You're experiencing the symptoms of radiation poisoning. I did warn you that radiation levels on Europa are high. Even in your spacesuit, you'd still feel headaches, nausea, dizziness, all the fun that comes from radiation sickness. And all that after spending only a few hours on this moon. If you don't return to your shielded spacecraft immediately, this exposure will kill you. Huh? Oh, no, no. I'm fine now. I'm, I'm good, Rico. You just, I just need to lie down for five minutes. Just... That's a bad idea. You need to return the samples to the spaceship. Right. The samples. I have to get the samples. The samples. This is 
still so sick though. The impact force from the cryovolcano has damaged your spacesuit. You're losing oxygen. I should have subscribed to the top tier of what have Patreon. <laughs> In the extreme conditions of Europa, without the full protection of a suit, you'd only have a few minutes to get to safety. In just one minute, severe frostbite would damage your exposed skin. After two minutes, you'd start shivering. Cue hypothermia. Another ten minutes later, and you'd lose consciousness and freeze to death. <laughs> Oh, wait, scratch all that. Looks like Chase's suit lost all the oxygen and he just suffocated. Now we'll never know if those samples had any life in them. Dark, mysterious, and consuming everything around them. Black holes will rip apart anything that passes their event horizon, but could there be more? What would happen if you fell into one of these monstrosities? How could you possibly travel through the black hole itself? And if you emerged out the other side, where would you end up? This is What If, and here's what would happen if you traveled through a black hole. Black holes aren't that much different than any other object in the universe that has mass, except that they are really, really dense. At their center is a singularity, basically an infinitely small point where all their matter is compressed. The more matter that's packed into a black hole's singularity, the stronger its gravitational pull. Considering that some black holes are the remnants of stars with more than 10 times the mass of our sun, they have a lot of gravity. And every black hole has an event horizon. This is the point of no return. Once you cross that, there's no way back out. And unless you traveled as fast as the speed of light, you wouldn't be able to escape it. We don't know exactly what happens to something beyond the event horizon because once something is past it, there's no way of sending a message back. But odds are, gravity would rip you apart, atom by atom. Unless there was some other way out? If you were lucky enough, you wouldn't just be venturing into the unknown depths of any normal black hole you'd be crossing the event horizon of a charged black hole, equipped with a one-way wormhole that connects the black hole with a white hole. Now, white holes are strange. Instead of consuming all matter in their path like black holes do, they only spit stuff back out into space, and nothing is able to enter a white hole. Except you wouldn't just cross the event horizon and end up spat out on the other side. You'd better be ready for one of the most mind-blowing experiences the universe has to offer. As you were preparing for the trip of a lifetime on the outskirts of the black hole, you'd see stars twisted around a perfect circle of darkness. It's too bad there wouldn't be much time to enjoy the view. This gravitational monster would start pulling you toward it faster and faster. The gravitational force of a black hole is unbelievably strong. It's so strong that it would turn you into spaghetti. If you were falling feet first, your legs would experience a significantly more intense gravitational pull than your head. Your body would get stretched into oblivion. Well, we don't want that to happen to you just yet, so let's say you'd fall into a wormhole just before the black hole ripped you apart. And don't forget, you'd be traveling through not just any black hole, but a charged one. Not only would there be a wormhole lurking inside it, but this black hole would also have two event horizons. 
But as you were crossing the space between the two points of no return, you'd likely not realize what's happened. You'd be in free fall, and as you'd fall deeper, you'd find the black circle in front of you appear to grow bigger and bigger. If the black hole was as large as the one at the center of the Milky Way, this would take about 20 seconds. And with all the painful spaghettification you'd be experiencing, those 20 seconds would seem to last for an eternity. But once you approached the inner horizon, the black hole would appear to stop expanding. And then, surprisingly, it would seem to shrink almost like you started falling away from it. For a moment, you might think you've already cleared it, but this wouldn't be the case. It's only an optical illusion. You're still in free fall. This trick on the eyes is caused by something known as relativistic beaming. All it would do is squeeze what you see in front of you to make it appear as if the black hole was shrinking and the light from the rest of the universe outside the black hole would appear brighter around its edges. But as you finally pass the inner horizon, that wouldn't be the only light you'd see. At this point, you'd be overwhelmed by an energetic bright burst. And not just any old boring burst of light. You'd be witnessing a reflection of the entire history of our universe seen through the singularity of the black hole. Within the inner event horizon, you'd now be careening through the wormhole connecting you to the white hole. But if you thought being stretched was bad enough, think again. You'd be trapped in an extremely unstable phenomenon. The enormous gravitational forces of the black hole would threaten to obliterate the wormhole any second. As you were crossing the second event horizon, you'd see another energetic burst of light. But this time, instead of seeing a reflection of the universe's entire past, you'd see its future. Keep in mind, this wouldn't be the future of the universe as you know it. And you wouldn't just be passing through the singularity of the black hole and out the other side. No you'd be about to get spewed out by a white hole into a completely different universe from your own. Finally, you'd be out of the white hole. As the distance between you and it increased, you'd also see all the light from our current universe that came along for the ride with you. And hey, congratulations! You'd be the first person to explore an entirely new universe there could be so many incredible things for you to discover. You could find yourself in a parallel universe. Another version of you could be living the best life you've always imagined for yourself. But hey, I mean, you just traveled through a black hole, so how much better could it get? Unfortunately, the news might not all be good. You could be stuck having to follow completely different laws of physics from the ones we know. Gravity could be weaker, stronger, or even non-existent. And the building blocks of matter could be made from dark matter. Or they could be made up of antimatter. In which case your mind-blowing joyride would be about to meet a deadly end. Antimatter and ordinary matter, like what you're made of, would annihilate each other upon contact. And worst of all, you wouldn't be able to just turn around and return home. Remember, you couldn't jump back into the white hole because it doesn't suck anything into it. That was a one-way trip. Sorry. Well, I hope it was fun while it lasted. Titan. The most majestic of Saturn's many moons. And the most promising for life, too. It's got a beautiful view and liquid lakes on its surface. The only problem is those lakes aren't filled with water. They're filled with liquid methane. Your mission is to take a five second dip in one of them. Of course, you'd have to land on Titan first. So 
buckle up for the most epic adventure of your lifetime. Titan is far. Even at its closest to Earth, this icy moon is still 1.2 billion kilometers away from us. You'd be looking at roughly seven years of travel alone in a spaceship. You'd need lots of provisions and a super advanced life support system. You know, it would be good if you made it to Titan and didn't freeze or suffocate somewhere in the middle of the solar system. Yeah, that's not going to happen to you. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. Seeing Saturn up close is amazing. Definitely the most spectacular of all the ringed planets in the solar system, but hey, enough sightseeing, it's time to make your way to your destination. Titan is unique in many ways. For one, it's larger than our moon. It's even bigger than Mercury, the smallest planet in our cosmic neighborhood. It's the only moon that has a thick atmosphere. It's also the only one that's covered in liquid lakes, rivers, and seas. And sometimes it rains here, too. Descending on Titan would take you about two and a half hours, and you couldn't just land anywhere. Like I say, Titan is covered in lakes, so unless you wanted to dip your entire spacecraft in liquid methane, you better choose your landing site carefully. Let's try this again. Okay, now that you've properly landed on Titan, let's go explore this icy world. This moon of Saturn might look a lot like Venus, but it's not as hellishly hot. Titan is one of the most hospitable places in the solar system. Yeah, its gravity is only 14% of Earth's, but its thicker atmosphere makes it possible for you to walk there even without a spacesuit. But I wouldn't recommend that. You'd need the spacesuit to keep you warm. Titan is very far away from the sun, so it doesn't receive as much warmth as we do here on Earth. You'd be taking a brisk stroll at a chilling minus 180 degrees Celsius. Well, you wouldn't exactly be strolling. More like bouncing around? Yeah, thanks to Titan's weaker gravity, you'd feel a lot lighter and could jump higher and move with less effort. Now, Titan's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, very similar to Earth's, but you still couldn't breathe on this moon because, well, that's where the similarity ends. While 95% of the air here is nitrogen, the remaining 5% is methane. You'd need an oxygen tank to survive even five seconds on this world. Yeah, it's not just the lakes that have methane in them. There's plenty of methane in Titan's clouds, and sometimes it even rains methane. But this rain isn't anything like you've seen on Earth. It would be more like rain in slow motion, thanks to Titan's lower gravity and thick atmosphere. On Earth, raindrops fall at about nine meters per second, but on Titan, their speed is only about 1.6 meters per second. That's six times slower. It would be pretty cool to walk in the rain here. But hey, you didn't come here for a walk in the rain. You came to take a dip in Titan's lakes. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Oh, excuse me? Who's here? Hi, let's do this. What's up, everybody? I'm Chase. I'm from the year 3050. And for the last, well... Things are a bit wobbly where I come from. I've been traveling through space and time a lot. Thing is, I die a lot. Like, a lot. <laughs> it's kind of like my special power. It all started when I touched this shiny alien cube. Now, I can jump between worlds, dimensions, time. And when I die, I always come back. I'm still trying to figure that one out. I, I think it has something to do with Einstein. I don't know. It's pretty cool. I jumped on the rings of distant planets, been the guest of honor at an alien feast, and not in a good way. Uh, 
And there was that one time I accidentally started an interstellar war. <laughs> Cute. But now I'm here on Titan to stop you from doing um, whatever it is you're doing. Because you only live once, <laughs> unless you're me. So, your mission is to take a swim in one of these methane pools? <laughs> Let me break it down for you. First off, this ain't no spa day. It's like diving into a freezer. Titan's got this super chilly vibe going on, you know what I mean? At these temperatures, water's harder than concrete. But methane and ethane, they're like, yeah, it's cold, bruv, but like, we can still chill in liquid form. And so they gather up in these cool little pools. Okay, I knew that too. Oh, up, 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 up. Sorry, no interrupting. I'm still just getting to the good part. Now, let's say you're wearing that fancy spacesuit. Good news, you won't freeze instantly into an astronaut popsicle. Bad news, that suit's gonna float. If for some wild reason you decided to take the plunge without the suit, well, that's it, my friend, lights out. You see, the intense cold would freeze you down to your bone. You couldn't move a muscle. And then the lack of oxygen would get jump. But five seconds with the spacesuit on, well, we'll definitely survive, probably. Let's test it. <laughs> okay. <gasps> ah, seems like someone's spacesuit can't withstand the cold. Someone needs an upgrade. It's so refreshing out here. I think I'll just stay another five seconds just to really enjoy it. Ah, oh, oh, hot, 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 Uh, Chase? Ah, don't worry. These sparks are supposed to happen. Oh, it's like a stabbing, burning feeling. It appears that the cold temperature cracked his suit and Methane reacted with the oxygen tank inside it. He should have read about this in the mission brief. Well, just leave him here, I guess? Anyway, the mission is a success. The only thing left is to figure out how to get home. Thousands of light years from Earth, there could be another planet hospitable to life. Kepler 69C. And you're about to travel to this alien world to see that life with your own eyes. What would it be like to make this epic journey so far across the universe? What kind of planet would you be likely to find upon arrival? And if you did discover life, what would it look like? This is What If, and here's what would happen if there's life on Kepler-69c. Located 2,383 light years from Earth in the Cygnus constellation is a potential super-Earth. At least that's what it's often referred to as. Kepler-69c is an exoplanet about 1.7 times larger than our planet. And it could also be around three and a half times more massive. But there's a catch. We don't really know if this planet is located within the habitable zone of its star. If it's too close, Kepler-69c would be too hot for liquid water to exist on its surface. If it's too far from its sun, well, then it would be nothing more than a frigid world. What we do know is that Kepler-69c orbits its star about 40% closer than Earth orbits the Sun. And that could mean that it isn't actually a super-Earth. It could be a super-Venus. So if you traveled all the way here, would you find life? Or a thick, scorching atmosphere boiling every drop of water on the planet? Before you begin your journey to Kepler-69c, there'd be one very important thing to keep in mind. It's far away. Almost 600 times further away than Proxima Centauri, our closest neighboring star. 
Even if you could travel, say, 1% of the speed of light, you wouldn't get there anytime soon. At this speed, you could whip around Earth in just over 13 seconds, but to get to Kepler-69c? Well, that would take you about 238,000 years. To even make this trip possible, you'd need a super advanced hibernation pod. You know, you don't want to grow too old and die before you could even get to your destination. Am I right? Well, hibernation technology that could help you sleep for over 200,000 years doesn't exist yet, but hey, this is what if. Anything's possible. By the time your ship makes its arrival, any life that may exist on Kepler-69c today could evolve or advance into something entirely different. Think about it this way. 300,000 years ago, humans were just beginning to create stone tools and spears. And look at you now, making a trip across the galaxy. Looking back at the planet you left behind, who knows what changes would happen to our human civilization during your trip. No matter what, it's way too late to turn around now. Based on the planet's distance from its star, we know that Kepler-69c receives a similar amount of sunlight as Venus. And despite being more massive than Earth, it has a relatively low density. All this means is that instead of metals, this rocky planet is made of silicate and carbonate minerals. That could make things a little complicated. You see, with all these minerals in the crust, Kepler-69c could have a really thick atmosphere. And to make matters worse, this atmosphere would be composed mostly of carbon dioxide. Uh-oh, did you choose the wrong super-Earth to travel to? Yeah, if Kepler-69c is anything like Venus, it would be a pretty hot planet. All because, similar to Venus, its clouds would trap the heat and create an extreme greenhouse effect. Kepler-69c's atmosphere would be caught in an endless cycle of getting thicker and hotter. But nobody said this world should be habitable for you. Oh no, once you took off your helmet, you'd instantly melt and suffocate. Like I said, life on this planet would be completely different from what you'd imagine. As you made your approach, you'd find surface temperatures as high as 475 degrees Celsius, and the atmospheric pressure would be over 90 times that of Earth at sea level. It would be like being 900 meters deep in the ocean, except you'd be on dry land. With conditions like this, you'd likely not find anything resembling an ocean here. Just like on Venus, the high temperatures would boil away all the water. Whatever life you could potentially encounter on this planet, it would need to be able to survive in these brutal conditions. Or it would have to exist somewhere else besides the surface. One place you could discover life on Kepler-69c would be up in the clouds. Around 50 kilometers up, temperatures would be much, much cooler they would range from about 30 to 70 degrees Celsius. And with its low density, this planet could have a surface gravity that would be just over 70% of what's found on Earth. This weaker gravity could allow life forms to thrive in the sky, where Kepler-69c is most hospitable. Life could just be floating freely in the atmosphere. This would be another way in which this planet could have far more in common with Venus than with Earth. Probes around Venus have picked up traces of a gas that could be a potential sign of life, phosphine. If you discovered phosphine in Kepler-69c's atmosphere, it could be the result of bacteria that don't require oxygen to survive. But be ready to hold your nose. This smelly gas has an odor similar to decaying fish. On Earth, the bacteria that produce phosphine often live in swamps or wetlands, but on Venus or Kepler-69c, 
this bacteria could exist in the thick, oxygenless atmosphere itself. So, in the end, you may have traveled a very, very long way to find the smallest and stinkiest of life forms. Now, on the upside, you've just discovered extraterrestrial life. Welcome to hell. Yeah, sorry, I meant Venus. Welcome to Venus. Some say it's Earth's twin, but this world is nothing like home. And you're about to experience this scorching hot landscape firsthand. Your mission is to spend five seconds on this hellish planet. And trust me, these are going to be a very long five seconds. Venus is the second planet from the Sun and our nearest neighbor. At its closest approach, Venus is a mere 40 million kilometers away from us. After just four months in space, you'd finally be able to witness this beautiful but deadly planet up close. Four and a half billion years ago, Venus and Earth formed in the same corner of our solar system. This space rock is about the same size as Earth, and its gravity is similar too, but unlike our home, the surface situation on Venus is extreme. We know this because we've sent probes to this scorching world. Some probes orbited it, some made a flyby, and some even landed on the surface of Venus, but those didn't last very long. What happened to them? Well. That's what you're about to find out. Time to make your way down to the surface. Ah, don't these clouds look beautiful? Well, don't inhale them. These yellowish bands streaking across the sky are clouds of sulfuric acid. If you could only get a whiff of them, you'd smell the reek of rotten eggs. But to do that, you'd need to remove your helmet, and I definitely do not recommend that. At a height of 50 kilometers above the surface, visibility is poor. You'd hardly be able to see anything. The incredibly thick atmosphere would block views of this planet and its tens of thousands of volcanoes. The atmosphere is mostly made up of carbon dioxide, and because it's so thick, it traps heat on the planet's surface, keeping it nice and toasty. Just how toasty are we talking? Well, you're gonna find out the hard way. As you descend another 15 kilometers, the haze would begin to clear. The world below would finally reveal itself. A rust-colored surface covered in mountains and volcanoes. Looks like this volcano is still active. You'd fly around a little to collect some samples and take in the view. Yep, the atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide with traces of nitrogen. That checks out. Okay, well, let's see if you can land here. This looks like the spot. Mission Control, am I clear for landing? Mission Control? Uh, looks like there's no signal. Initiating the landing sequence without clearance. Fingers crossed. Landing your spacecraft would kick up clouds of dust that would take several minutes to settle down in the soupy atmosphere. As it clears, you'd look up into the sky, but you wouldn't find the familiar yellow circle of the sun. On Venus, it always looks like dawn, no matter what time of day it is. That's because the Venusian atmosphere only lets about 10% of the sunlight that hits it reach the surface. But wait, what were we saying earlier about the space probe that landed on Venus? Oh yeah, Venera 13. This Soviet probe made its fatal landing back in 1981. It survived the descent and lasted for a whopping 127 minutes. That's longer than any other spacecraft that had made it to the surface. 
But then, Venera 13 gave way to the violent, uninviting environment of this hell. It was likely crushed under extreme pressure. Or it melted. But it's too late to turn around now. You've lived through the one hour long landing and you're so close. All you need to do to complete your mission is to spend five seconds out there. Uh, yeah, out there. In the most extreme environment you've ever been to. You made it! Whoa, the atmosphere is so strange. You can hardly lift your arms. Even though Venus has about the same gravity as Earth, you'd be feeling the sheer weight of its immensely dense air. It would feel like you were walking through water. Very hot water. And you'd be glad you were wearing so much protective gear. A quick look at your thermometer would tell you that it's a sweltering 475 degrees Celsius out here. That's hot enough to melt lead. Your pressurized suit would be working hard to keep you safe. Without it, you'd be crushed under all that pressure before you could even complete your mission. This isn't so bad after all. Hey, if a spacecraft could last over two hours some 40 years ago, well, you and your shiny new gear can survive longer, right? Venus is right here for you to discover. Just take a few more steps. Suddenly, something distracts you from the first ever first-hand human analysis of Venus's surface conditions. Your protective suit breaks. The drastic pressure shift would immediately make you feel like you were deep underwater. With an atmospheric pressure 90 times that of Earth, Venus would be crushing you from all directions. At the same time, you'd be struggling to breathe in an atmosphere without any oxygen. Any atmosphere you did manage to inhale would scald the inside of your mouth and the top of your throat. Unless you could scramble very quickly back to the safety of your spacecraft, you'd be dead within seconds. One hundred and twenty light years away from us, there's an exoplanet that can potentially host life. It's called K218b, and it's a world you'd want to visit. K218b isn't exactly like Earth, it's more like a super Earth. Yeah, it's 2.6 times larger and almost nine times more massive than our planet. Scientists think it could be a Haitian exoplanet, which is just a fancy way of saying that it likely has a hydrogen-rich atmosphere and is covered in liquid ocean. That means that K218b could be home to alien life. Only it would take a really long time to get there. If you were hurtling toward this space rock from Earth, you'd reach your destination in about 1.3 million years. Yeah, you heard right. Million. K218b has a lot of methane and carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. That's not exactly breathable air, so you'd still need a spacesuit to walk on this world. And I wouldn't be too hyped up about its ocean, either. If an exoplanet has liquid on it, it doesn't mean that the liquid is water. It could be methane or ammonia, even acid. Like, even in our own solar system, there's a moon covered in liquid lakes, but these are methane and ethane lakes, and I uh, wouldn't recommend swimming there. K218b could have a pretty mild temperature, for an exoplanet, that is. At minus 100 degrees Celsius, you'd find this world incredibly cold. Now, the most exciting thing we've found out about this world is that it could have traces of dimethyl sulfide. Woot woot! Well, on Earth, this molecule can only be produced by living things, and that means K218b could be home to alien life. Now, it doesn't mean that this life would be intelligent. It could be aquatic or microbial. 
maybe even complex life if the conditions for it are just right. We won't know for sure unless we travel to explore this interstellar world. Now, how do we know all this? Well, we had the James Webb Space Telescope look at this distant world and take detailed measurements of its atmosphere. Most of the exoplanets have been discovered using what's called the transit method. It's when a planet passes in front of its star and blocks its starlight. That's when scientists study the wavelengths around the planets, and some of those wavelengths can tell us what kind of atmosphere those distant planets have. The problem is, exoplanets are really far away. Trying to figure out what their surfaces are like just by peering through even our most powerful telescopes is not easy. Some scientists will argue that K218b isn't a super-Earth at all, but a mini-Neptune. And that's a bummer, because, as you know, Neptune is an ice giant. And if K218b is also an ice giant, then the chances for alien life on this planet don't look so good. Now, you don't have a million years to travel to this world to discover it for yourself, so maybe we should look at a world that's a lot closer to Earth. Like Proxima Centauri b. Proxima Centauri is the closest star we've discovered, only 4.2 light years away from Earth. It's part of the Alpha Centauri star system, with not two, but three stars orbiting each other. The exoplanet Proxima Centauri b orbits only one of these stars, but you'll still see the other two stars as bright dots in the sky. This exoplanet is slightly larger than Earth and revolves uncomfortably close to its host star. Luckily, that star is a red dwarf, and that's much cooler and smaller than our sun. Which is good news, because that means this planet isn't getting toasted like Mercury. Scientists estimate Proxima Centauri b has an average temperature of about minus 39 degrees Celsius. That's pretty comfortable as far as alien worlds go. The bad news is that we still don't know much about the exoplanet's gravity or atmosphere. It might be our best candidate to set up an interstellar base, but it also could have a harsh environment unsuitable for humanity's future home. It might even have an ocean of acid or something deadly like that. The only way to find out is to travel there. And if Proxima Centauri b doesn't work out, well, don't worry, there are plenty of potentially habitable worlds out there. Like this one. Ross 128b is 11 light years from Earth. It's the second closest potentially habitable world scientists have discovered. And it's more promising than Proxima Centauri b. The thing is, they both orbit red dwarf stars, only Proxima b's host star is a lot more active and violent. It occasionally erupts and bathes Proxima b in radiation. Ross 128b's star is nice and quiet. And even though this world orbits 20 times closer to its star than Earth is to the Sun, it still lies in the habitable zone. Because like I said, red dwarfs are way cooler than the Sun. And by cooler, I just mean temperature. This world could have a balmy average temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. That's only slightly hotter than the average temperature here on Earth. I don't know about you, but I could settle there. Now, we don't know enough about this world to call it our new home. It likely has lots of harmful radiation reaching its surface, and its atmosphere might not be breathable. But hey, that's not much worse than Mars. With efficient life support systems in place, we could make it work. Besides, this super-Earth might have its own life on it. If Ross 128b did have alien life, it could be extremely different from what you might imagine. Just think about making the first contact with an alien species. What would that be like? This blue marble-like planet looks just like Earth, but only five seconds on this hostile death orb 
would kill you. Welcome to HD 189733B. This planet is enormous, even larger than Jupiter. And to keep comparing it to the largest planet in our solar system, it's also entirely made of gas. That's why scientists classify HD 189733b as a hot Jupiter. This planet is located so close to its star that it completes its orbit in just over two days. Yeah, HD 189733b is 13 times closer to its sun than Mercury is to our sun. And even though its star is cooler than ours, this fake Earth is still way outside its star system's habitable zone. That means no liquid water can exist on a planet's surface. Just how this giant gaseous planet developed so close to its star is still a mystery. One theory is that HD 189733b formed right next to it during the star's earliest moments. Or it could have developed further away, only to be pulled in as the rest of the planetary system formed. But there's one thing we know for sure. A visit to HD 189733b would be a plunge into hell with no chance of escape. Now, even if you knew there wasn't a single drop of liquid water on this planet, you'd have a hard time believing it as you approached the giant blue marble. With an average daytime temperature of nearly 1100 degrees Celsius, this planet is twice as hot as Venus, and Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system. One of the reasons for this intense heat is that the planet is tidally locked to its star just like our own moon is to Earth. That means HD 189733b takes as much time to spin on its axis as it does to revolve around the star. So one side of the planet is constantly in daylight, while the other side is shrouded in darkness. The inviting look of this world doesn't come from its oceans like it does here on Earth. No, this hellish planet gets its color from clouds of molten silicate particles. These particles scatter more blue light than red, making the planet appear blue. Silica is the primary ingredient in glass, and you should bring a heavy-duty umbrella because you'd need to take cover from what would essentially be hot, molten glass rainstorms. But that's not the only danger you'd need to be ready to brace yourself against the extremely powerful winds that you'd find sweeping across the planet. With speeds up to 7,000 kilometers per hour, these gusts are almost 30 times stronger than even the most powerful Category 5 hurricanes on Earth. Compared to the strongest winds on other planets in our solar system, HD's winds are almost four times stronger than those on Neptune. But hey, they might smell a little better than the ice giant's hydrogen sulfide clouds. Those carry a whiff of rotten eggs. Blech. HD's winds are so fast that they'd whip past you at about six times faster than the speed of sound. They would be extremely loud, but I think you'd be more worried about them tearing your body apart. You might be long gone by now, killed by that molten glass rain. In any case, you wouldn't last too long on HD 189733b. I really don't recommend traveling there. But there are some planets out there that can kill you even faster. Check out OGLE TR56b. This gas giant sits in a galaxy nearly 100 light years away from Earth. It's even larger than HD. Its mass is nearly 1.4 times as much as Jupiter's, and somehow it's even closer to its star, too. You'd find this world to be incredibly scorching hot. Surface temperatures on this planet average around 1700 degrees Celsius. That's so hot that it turns metal to gas, creating iron clouds in the upper atmosphere. If you got caught in the rain here, 
you'd find it to be an extremely unpleasant and deadly shower of hot molten iron. Your skin would burn right off, and so would your insides. But things could get even hotter. Some 670 light years away from Earth, there's a planet so hellish that it's tearing molecules apart. Meet Kelt 9b. This gas giant is almost three times more massive than Jupiter. It takes Kelt only one and a half Earth days to speed through the orbit around its sun. And just like HD 189733b, it's tidally locked with one side always facing the hot star. Landing on this planet, you'd experience temperatures as high as 4,300 degrees Celsius. It's the most scorching exoplanet we've ever discovered. Scientists call this gas giant an ultra-hot Jupiter. And those high temperatures also make Kelt 9b hotter than most stars in the universe. So hot that it would destroy you. Come on. This world rips apart molecular hydrogen gas. What do you think it would do to your body? But before you even arrive on this hot planet, you'd be exposed to deadly amounts of radiation coming from its host sun. Yeah, Kelt 9b receives about 44,000 times more energy from its star than Earth does from the sun. This radiation would cook you alive instantly. Okay. If you somehow managed to survive all the lethal radiation of Kelt's star and the unimaginable heat of the planet, well, you'd still have to take on its incredibly strong winds. Scientists think those winds could reach speeds of 60 kilometers per second. Yeah, that's 30 times faster than the winds on the deceivingly Earth-looking planet HD 189733b. Okay, so if I get this straight, Kelt 9b would swirl you, burn you, and tear your molecules apart. Hmm, 1 out of 10, would not recommend. If you think meeting your demise on these kinds of hellish planets could be fun, well, I have some better travel suggestions for you. You know, not everything out there in space is utterly terrifying. There are planets that orbit their stars at a safe distance, just like the Earth orbits the Sun. We've yet to study those worlds in depth, but some of the exoplanets we've found so far could be even better for life than Earth. And you know what? That's a story for another What If. If this is how you picture walking on Uranus, eh, you're wrong. Let's start this again. Are you ready to take a trip to the outer regions of the solar system? To explore the weirdest planet in our cosmic neighborhood? To venture down into a place that's never been studied up close by any spacecraft? Buckle up for an 